This is the Extra Point Podcast. During this podcast, we will dive deeper into our Sunday teaching and share practical next steps for your faith journey. Now, let's kick off the Extra Point. Hi, I'm Cheryl Ross, and next steps and discipleship pastor here at Southridge Church, and I'm with Scott Beha, our lead pastor. We want to welcome you to the Extra Point Podcast. If you have not liked or subscribed to this, make sure that you do so. That way you don't miss out on any new content. Um, this past Sunday, we were in another week of our Rise and Fall series where we're going through the book of First Samuel. And this Sunday, we heard a story of where um, King Saul the first king of Israel actually kind of got something right. And um, we, we talked a lot about how if you feel trapped or stuck, that you can know that help is on the way. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's this dynamic that you shared about how um, in this story, the, their enemies wanted to gouge out their right eye, right? They wanted to gouge out one of their eyes. And you shared how this was a thing for them because this allowed them to still serve them, but it would hinder them to fight back against them and how that relates to our lives. So just share a little bit more about that because I thought that was such a good practical example of how um, the enemy is with us. Yeah. So in the ancient world, the vast majority of people either were right-handed or were just forced to be Mm right-handed. So they would hold their shield with their left hand, which would pretty much cover their left side. Mm -hmm. So if they gouge out their right eye, it would make them completely unable to actually Mm -hmm. fight back against um, their enemies. And so when they gouged out the right eye, yes, it was meant to be a sign of disgrace and and such, um, but it was also to render them powerless to fight back. Mm -hmm. And what you see on the physical level in the story, we see at the spiritual level, is what the enemy always wants to do in our life is to put us in a position to where we won't fight back. Like he wants us to beat like to beat us down to the point where we don't have the will or the ability to even fight back. So he mm-hmm. wants to overwhelm us with guilt and shame mm-hmm. or um, just whatever that he possibly can to, to steal away that will to fight. Because as long as you have the will to fight, you have a chance to get free. But at the yeah. moment that you just settle in and make a deal – with the enemy and go, you know what, if this is as good as it's going to get, then Mm -hmm. I guess we'll just stop fighting. Like a practical example of this would be, let's say that there's a couple, their marriage is not good. Mm -hmm. They go, you know what, we're just going to tough it out. Marriage isn't any good, but you know, we'll just suffer through with each other, whatever, but we're not going to fight. We're not going to try to make things Mm -hmm. better. Okay. The enemy just won. The enemy just won. In that moment, you've gone, okay, this is as good as it's going to get. Nothing's going to get better. We're just going to stop fighting. Mm-hmm. Right? Or somebody with an addiction, they go, you know what? Now I'm only getting drunk or only getting high on the weekends, at least. I'm mm-hmm. not doing it. It's not affecting my job. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to make that deal and go, okay, as long as it's just just there, and then I won't even fight it no more because nothing's getting better no matter how many times I try. You know, things just, it is what it is, and you just give up that will to fight. When that's, when when you get there, you have to realize that's exactly what the enemy wants. Right? The the goal of all warfare is to get your opponent to a position where they no longer want to fight. And they will wave the white flag and let you proceed however you want. Mm -hmm. And so you can continue to serve that master in that weekend state so you continue to indulge the issue Mm -hmm. but you've now lost your will to fight and never get free and when you're there you are in really really dangerous territory yeah um so you you got to be very careful and and truthfully just never lose your will to fight Mm -hmm. um because and you won't lose your will to fight if you understand the rest of the sermon which is that help is always on its way and so even though there's times that we get to a place in our life where we go, this feels hopeless, Mm -hmm. this feels like nothing's getting better, you may feel like that in the moment, Mm -hmm. but if we can always remember that there is help that is available to us, there is help Mm -hmm. that when the people of Jabesh Gilead went and sought the king, 
he was able to send help. Yeah. That's still the case for God's people today. Yeah. When you feel like you don't know, you know, where to turn, you mm-hmm. can still seek the king and the king will send help. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying this is not some like pray a prayer, snap your fingers and all of a sudden right. you're not an alcoholic anymore. That's not the way things work. Yeah. But you will find that will to fight. Mm-hmm. You will find strength for the next day to mm-hmm. do the next right thing. I'm, I'm not saying that one prayer fixes, oh, I prayed, Jesus showed up and just wiped everything right. out. No, I'm not saying that that's the way that it always works. Could it work like that? Sure. Um, but normally there's a process because the process of getting free is normally every bit as important mm-hmm. as the product of getting free. Yeah. Right? Like if getting free didn't cost you anything, then you're more likely to fall back into it Mm -hmm. if you there wasn't some sort of process that you had to walk through so the process of getting free is every bit as important Mm -hmm. um so that's why god doesn't just show up and wipe out all your issues right um he's gonna walk you through a process of getting free so the way you really appreciate the freedom yeah and i think also to strengthen your your character your faith your trust all of that like to where once you've gotten to that place, then you know, like, you know, you've been through it and you've overcome with his help to where then, you know, if there's something else that comes along the way, it gives you that, that faith to look back and say, okay, God helped me through this. Now he can help me through this as well. Um, I think that was so key. And I think like you shared on Sunday, you said, even if you're the one who got yourself there, yeah. like, even if you did that, like just reach out because he will hear you. He will come and help. Um, I think, you know, the kids are, are the, the teens here are learning um, through a series called Not Okay. And I taught the first week of it. And it was about, you know, the woman with the issue of blood that was bleeding, had blood for 12 years. And we talked about how it's, um, it's kind of has a mental health emphasis, but it was that concept of like, it's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. And how like, no matter what, if you just reach out to Jesus, mm-hmm. He will help you. He will give you hope. Like when you're not okay, you can find hope in Jesus. That's what um, they learned. And I feel like it coincided with this so well. Um, But then you talked about how um, you kind of did a flashback from the previous chapter Mm -hmm. um, of how there were people who doubted Saul. We talked about this a little bit last week, but how, um, how they doubted him and how he ignored him. But at this point, when they have victory over this, yeah. then this vindicated everything that Samuel had said about Saul. This vindicated him. And we have that same vindication and victory, like through Jesus' victory. Yeah. Um, share a little bit about that. Yeah. So all of the stories of the kings and anything like that in the Old Testament, in one way or another, is always meant to point towards the, the real king of Israel, um, Jesus. And so there's, especially in this story, you see the, the really clear parallels that there was these doubters in chapter 10, 1 Samuel chapter 10, that literally asked, they said, can, Sa- can Saul actually set us free? Can he actually deliver us? That's what they're asking. Like, we need, like, we don't think that he really can. This is the exact type of things that the people are wrestling with when Jesus of Nazareth is doing his ministry, going, really, this guy? Mm -hmm. Like one of the guys that came to be one of the 12 disciples actually said, can anything good come from Nazareth? Like he's going, I don't, this guy's not even from the right town. Like he's from this like backwaters, no name place. There was no parade. There was no pomp and circumstance Mm -hmm. when he came in, like, who is this guy? Like he went to the river to be baptized by John the Baptist. What type of savior would need to be baptized by somebody else? Like yeah. over and over, like we see people come to follow Jesus and then we see them leaving him whenever things get really real. Like there was doubters constantly. Like when he was performing miracles, the Pharisees are going, Oh, the only reason why he's able to perform miracles is because he does th- so through dark powers. They're saying he's in league with Satan, so they're 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 doubting. He says over and over, like he tells his disciples, "I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed, but don't worry. I'm going to be raised back up." And mm-hmm. the whole time, you can see they go, I, "We don't know what you're talking about," mm-hmm. to be honest. And then he says this wild stuff like, I'm going to tear down the temple, and in three days I'm going to rebuild it, clearly talking mm-hmm. about his resurrection. And people are like, oh, really, you're going to do that? Yes, he's really going to do that. 
And the thing, like, we miss this a lot of times because sometimes we just want to talk about the resurrection Mm -hmm. in a way that we go like, oh, look, see, um, now you can have eternal life because Mm -hmm. of the resurrection. Because, well, there's there's a lot more going on there. The resurrection Mm -hmm. of Jesus of Christ was his vindication, Mm -hmm. meaning that everything that he ever said or everything that he ever Mm -hmm. done was actually true. It was actually that that that's what's going on there. It's there. If you want to know who Jesus is and how he fulfills all the Old Testament prophecies, especially that of the Son of Man from Daniel chapter Mm 7, it's through the vindication of the Son of Man that we come to realize who Jesus really is. Yeah. That's why it's important when we talk about Saul being vindicated, it's the same thing. It's Mm -hmm. through that victory that everyone goes, ah, Saul really is God's anointed, which is the word Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so you see the very clear parallels Mm -hmm. there. Jesus had these doubters, and it was through his resurrection. Because I'm telling you, when he was on the cross, Mm -hmm. the the disciples weren't there. John was there. Yeah. The the rest of the disciples had scattered. Yeah. Peter had denied him. Right. Just, you know, hours before. Mm -hmm. The rest of them scattered, were hiding. Mm -hmm. They're going, we don't. We don't want anything to do with this guy. Maybe he really wasn't the real deal. Right. They're doubting. Yeah. Everyone's doubting. Yeah. Until the vindication comes. Mm-hmm. And the amazing thing is, especially in First in Samuel 11, is Saul has every right to treat these doubters as traitors mm-hmm. and decides to pardon them instead, which is mm-hmm. the perfect picture of Jesus on the cross going, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Showing mercy to his enemies rather than giving them exactly what they deserve. Right. And so in this story, you have the people of Jabesh Gilead who were in the wrong, mm-hmm. most likely because of some sort of idolatry. Right. The text doesn't say it, but the only reason why God allows his people to be overran by other nations right. was always about idolatry and sin. Yeah. So the people of Jabesh Gilead definitely were in the wrong. The doubters within the kingdom were definitely wrong. And in both cases... No matter who you are, whether you're just doubting or whether you're actively turning your back against God or whatever it is, the king comes to your rescue, mm-hmm. helps on the way. Whether you're the problem yeah. um, or or whatever, mm-hmm. like help is always on the way in the form of the king. And so this story plays a perfect picture of what Jesus has done and how it's really only the king that's able to pardon you mm-hmm. whenever you're guilty. And we're all guilty. You're guilty, I'm guilty, everyone listening to this is guilty of turning our backs on God. Yeah. It's what we do. It's mm-hmm. our own idolatry, and it looks so different um, than ancient Israel, which is why we right. are not real quick to call it what it is. Right. But the story of the scriptures is always about how humanity turns to other things and gives up their dominion that God gave them in Genesis 1, yeah. gives their dominion over to created things, created the created order, mm-hmm. false gods, mm-hmm. and how those things then enslave them. Yeah. Like what we what you see in Israel with the Asherahs and Baal mm-hmm. and all of these other gods is we're given our dominion, yeah. our power, and yeah. then you're going to enslave us. And the way that God would do that is by sending. But we do the same exact thing here in our life. Let's say that you give your power and your dominion over to alcohol. Mm-hmm. And you become an alcoholic mm-hmm. that now masters you, that mm-hmm. you're now. It started off as I'm turning away from one thing to another, but now it masters you. Yeah. Um, this can happen with, with even with hobbies. This can happen with, with money, and this can happen with your job. Mm-hmm. And you go, oh, but these, some of these things aren't necessarily bad things. Like, it's not, not, not everything is heroin, right? Like, right. I get it. But anything that you give power over you to enslave you, to where you go, like, I, I, this is this is what kind of, like, breaks my heart about church uh, folks um, these days. Is that, like, you'll find people that are willing to come to church. Mm-hmm. You will not find people that are willing to let Jesus actually change them. Right. I mean, like, and I'm talking, like, you see a drastic difference in the way that they spend their time. Yeah. In the way that they spend their money. Yeah. Like, you just don't see that. They're willing to be inconvenienced once a week Mm -hmm. to come to church whenever they're free. Yeah. But they're not willing to actually go like, like this is why I say all the time, like 
you, you've probably settled for something other than a true relationship with Jesus if you've never had to tell yourself no. Right. If you've never had to go, you know what? We're not going to do that this mm-hmm. weekend. Even though we can afford it, even though we have the time to do it, even though we have the passion to do it, we're not going to do that this weekend. Yeah. We're just not, we're going to tell ourselves no. Mm-hmm. We're going to spend time as a family. And we're going to be present at worship on the week. If you've never had that moment where you go, I have every right mm-hmm. and all the resources to go and do something, but I'm not going to. Right. Then you've probably settled for a different version mm-hmm. of Jesus. Like if it hasn't interrupted your life in that way, mm-hmm. then you've settled for something else. Yeah. And and so that's, it. it, it, it bothers me because, You'll get people that will think that they're very sincere in their seeking of Jesus, but really, upon further review, all that has happened in their life is they started going to church. Yeah. And that's, there was plenty of people that were present for the sermons of Jesus mm-hmm. that are lost for eternity right now. Yeah. There's plenty of them. There's probably thousands of them mm-hmm. that saw Jesus of Nazareth teach. They saw his miracles. They were at the feeding of the 5,000. They, they heard that he walked on water. There's tons of those people that will be lost for eternity mm-hmm. because they only all they did was show up. They never let it actually affect them. They never let it mm-hmm. like lead to sacrifice for them whatsoever. And it, I don't know how mm-hmm. to get I, – I, I, it's actually – it's not even something that I can know how to do. Right. It really is only – people cooperating with the spirit yeah and it happens so few and far between it mm-hmm. seems like even though i mean i could tell you the story after story right of people that it's happened yeah but like the vast majority of people are just they just go to church whenever they can yeah and that checks the box on facebook that i'm a christian and mm-hmm. it's like there's just no version of christianity that you'll see anywhere mm-hmm. that people just showed up yeah you, you, there's no example of that. Like people that were Christians in the first century mm-hmm. church, they participated in the life of the church. Mm-hmm. There was yeah. no one that was just like, you know what, you guys, yeah. uh, we got a lot going on this weekend. Yeah. No, actually, it was the only people that did that in the New Testament was when Jesus was telling a story about a banquet that he was having, uh-huh. and there was people that were too busy to show up. And yeah. He said, "That's fine. Throw them to the side. Bring other ones. Yeah. Bring other ones because it's." Yeah. You don't want to make the relationship with Jesus this list of like, well, you got to do this, 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 and this. But you can't. And so the church has done so good at trying to get away from legalism right. in that way. But the problem is there was a double sided sword mm-hmm. around legalism that we yeah. stopped telling people that even though these are not the things that make you mm-hmm. saved, these are definitely the things that saved people do. Yeah. And so that you've tried to find a different way yeah. that. The church has always met together. Yeah. The church has always had small group fellowship from yeah. the beginning. Go read the book of Acts. They met in the, mm-hmm. the temple courts daily, and they met from house to house. Yeah. There was always a large group gathering. There was always a small group gathering yeah. that the Christians were a part of. It yeah. wasn't like, oh, well, we just don't have time for that. we got a lot going on. It's like, no, this is what they did. They served. They shared their resources. Mm-hmm. They broke bread together. They were part of each other's mm-hmm. lives. There is no version of Christianity that you could be following where the only thing that's different about you is that, oh, I'll right. go to church now. Yeah. It's just not. It's not a biblical version of Christianity. Now, well, small groups or hanging out with other Christians or, or any of that, does that save you? No. No, because yeah. it's not legalism. But it's definitely what saved people do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even before Acts, it's what Jesus did. Like if we yeah. look at the life of Jesus and we're told – to just follow him. And so if we're following him and what he did, then we're going to do those things in our following. Like, and so it, 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 it goes back to that and it's so simple, but like we complicate it so much and we put so many things above them, just like the Israelites we see over and over again. Um, and it's something that we do have to fight against. And so making sure that we are in a place where we don't hinder ourselves or keep ourselves to where we're unable to fight back. Um, cause it is a constant fight. I think like, even for us, there are times and moments where we have to fight back against those things yep. that, that might want to pull us, you know, in other ways, like we have to continually fight and we're not exempt from that either. 
but it is making sure to remember that help is on the way. All we have to do is reach out. All we have to do is ask Jesus to come and help us and he will be there. So make sure that you're doing that. Uh, We hope this finds you well and that this has helped you in your faith journey. We'll be right back here again next week with another sermon teaching a deep dive into that from our Rise and Fall series. So we hope um, to see you then. Thanks for tuning in to The Extra Point. Be sure to subscribe to the Southridge Church Podcast and tune in every Wednesday for another episode of The Extra Point.